Well, good afternoon and welcome to our latest episode of Real Estate Talk with Lisa. So glad that you decided to join us today. My name is Lisa Jeffrey. I'm your host. I'm a real estate agent here in the DMV. And uh, we started this show uh, last year uh, with the theme of opening the door with keys of independence. So we're looking to educate, motivate, empower our audience in every area of real estate and our kind of our fresh thing this year is opening the doors with keys of uh, and not just opening doors with keys of independence but open doors for 2019 okay. uh, just a, just an extra kind of thrust that way because you know it's kind of turbulent times mm-hmm. you know everybody's uncertain are we, are we going to work tomorrow we're we not going to work tomorrow <laughs> you know what I mean and so we just wanted to kind of put that proclamation out there and said mm-hmm. we still believing in uh, open doors for this year and I want to introduce my distinguished, very well-known co-host, Dr. Malcolm Beach. So glad to have you back. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. Yes, indeed. I'm telling you, the man just got back from the from the uh, Africa, from Kenya. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. And that's going to tie into our theme. Uh, our topic today is going to be migration and gentrification what's really going on. Mm Because, you know, we get all the reports, we see the new buildings go up, we see people moving. You know, a lot of the uh, black history events have the theme. I know Prince George's County uh, had an art contest, Mm -hmm. an art piece that they unveiled, talking about black migrations. Uh, Sala's event was black migrations. Uh, And also there's a series of events in Carnegie Hall uh, going on over the next couple of months talking about different um, aspects of migrations, not only black, but, you know, overall. And so when we're talking about that, you know, having an idea about what's going on in the realm uh, of migration and how that ties into gentrification, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Are Mm -hmm. we moving because we can't afford to live here? Or when we decided to move out to other places to expand our living, then they decided to move back and fix up. So that's, (laughs) (laughs) oh, they're gone now. Let's rush back in. Uh, So that's one of the, um, one of the things that, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, So we're going to take a quick break, uh, and we're going to be back in just a moment. We're going to be joined by uh, Dr. Lionel Kimball. Uh, He is the uh, Vice President for Programs at Asala, who's done quite a bit of work in that field uh, for the Chicago area. So we're going to talk to him a little bit. Uh, Dr. Beach is going to join in with us. going to have a little bit of a lively discussion because this is uh, part of our real estate viewpoint for today. So we'll be right back after this break. MyRE 360 is the future of real estate investing. As a MyRE 360 member, you can learn the business, build your team, find a deal, and manage your project all at the push of a button. MyRE 360 is a unique platform that allows members to know with whom they are conducting business with simple to read user stats, badges that highlight their professional accomplishments, and user ratings showing others' previous experiences with investors just like yourself. With the education component, you can learn all aspects of real estate at your convenience. You have the option to learn by topic, learn from a specific educator, or learn about what's happening in your local market. If you are interested in a specific topic, for example wholesaling, simply click on Wholesaling and instantly you could learn all about Wholesaling 101. If you're interested in learning from a specific educator, view their course and their educator profile. You can subscribe to that educator and get access to their wealth of knowledge at the click of a button. Building your real estate team has never been easier. You can search through a list of MyRE360 verified vendors and build your local team with the industry's best in just a matter of minutes. Each vendor you are interested in working with will have badges highlighting the extent of their experience and user ratings from other investors who have previously worked with that vendor. You can create new relationships by adding vendors to your team that are interested in working a specific deal you are considering. You can create different teams based on your investment strategy that consist of vendors that offer those particular services. For example, you can create a team for just your fix and flip deals your rental projects, or have a separate team for commercial transactions. Looking for your next project? 
Search credible deals for MyRE360 verified sellers and wholesalers. You can filter your search based on the age of the deal, purchase price, cost of repair, and estimated profit. With the project management tool, you can take advantage of the most robust real estate management system available from your desktop computer or on the go with the mobile app. Once you create your project, you can take advantage of everything the project management tool offers. The Rehab Estimator feature allows you to get real-time project repair estimates during your inspection of the home. Simply identify the size of the property you are inspecting, input a number based on the extent of work needed, and an estimate for that repair line item will be calculated and identified. The pre-purchase checklist walks you through the step-by-step -step process on the actions necessary to prepare for your closing after a contract has been executed. You can set calendar reminders of upcoming tasks so no action item goes overlooked. The rehab tool combines the project and process workflow, scheduling, identification of the technician type, accounting, and visibility to the overall project completion rate into a single, simple-to-use tool that accounts for everything you need to successfully navigate your project. Manage your project while on the go with the luxury of your entire management system right on your device or from your home computer. The post-closing checklist is a step-by-step -step breakdown of everything that is required to officially close out a project after it has been sold. Take advantage of the built-in calendar reminders of upcoming tasks so no action item goes overlooked. Once you have your team created and your next project secured, take advantage of our state-of-the-art push-button technology that allows you to communicate with your entire team with just the push of a button. When you 360 the deal, each team member will get a message specific to their role in the project. This eliminates the need of sending multiple messages to different team members, as each message is customized to that team member's role. You can also 360 the team. With the push of a button, you can communicate updates or project changes to your entire team with customized or pre-populated messages. Push button real estate investing comes full circle with MyRE360. All right, welcome back. Uh, those of you that uh, saw our break, uh, that's my RE360. So you're interested in real estate investing with the push of a button. That's a great software. You can learn a lot more for, about the company by tuning in to last week's episode. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's going to be, I think, a great innovative tool going forward for the real estate investing community. So now I want to go on to our first calling guest, which is going to be Dr. Lionel Kimball. He is currently the vice president uh, for programs for SALA. He is also the associate professor of history at Chicago State University. And, um, you know, we're really excited to have him on because his work is focused on uh, housing and employment as civil rights issues with a special focus on Chicago's African-American communities. Now, his work has appeared in the Journal of Illinois History, the Journal of Illinois State Historical Society, the Journal of African-American History, the Encyclopedia of African-American History, the Encyclopedia of Labor and Working Class History. He has appeared on CBS, WBEZ in Chicago, BBC Radio, and WVON in Chicago and been interviewed by the Chicago Crusader and the Chicago Tribune, USA Today, and the publication of the National Park Service. Uh, his first book is entitled A New Deal for Bronzeville Housing, Employment, and Civil Rights in Black Chicago, 1935 to 1955. So his body of work has uh, positioned him to have uh, a strong voice um, based on his, his studies, uh, and his experience with respect to uh, our topic today, migration and gentrification. So, Dr. Kimball, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, we spoke before, and the way the topic came about, and I had shared with uh, Dr. Beach and yourself during the break, is being at the Asala event, and uh, the panel was talking about black migration. That's a big theme uh, nationwide for Black History mm. uh, Month. For this year uh, and looking at the migration 
and also looking at gentrification is um, kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg, uh, in terms of how they relate to one another. Uh, based on your work, um, how do you see those two um, issues uh, relation to one another? Well, first of all, I, I think looking at the 20th century and probably even before that, the, the, the migration and, and really how black people have moved across this country, both internally and internationally, it's been one of the, you know, probably one of the, the major events of, of, of our time in, in, this, in, in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. Our history is one about movement. And I think but for, for this particular topic, the, the great migration and the various migrations during World War One, World War Two, and, and after, I think um, our movement north and west really redefined and reshaped what our, what our American cities look like. I think we added a, a, a level of, of dynamic interaction with existing uh, organizations, uh, labor organizations, civic organizations, educational organizations. And I think without this migration uh, from black folks from the south into the north, I don't think that uh, the country really looked the way it does right now uh, mm -hmm. in any way, politically, economically, socially. So I think it's, it's an incredibly important uh, uh, historical event. Excellent, excellent. Now, when you look at um, gentrification uh, that we see now um, in the nation, in different metropolitan areas where um, you have um, African American, you have, first you have uh, white populations moving, say, from the cities to the suburbs, uh, getting the bigger houses, uh, and then um, slowly you have African-American populations moving from the city into the suburbs with the white populations either moving further out or further in, but when they come back into the cities, the uh, level of rebuilding and renovation typically prices out the African-American populations in terms of coming back in. Um, do you find that some of the migrations out of the cities is due to the fact of gentrification, or they they're not they're not as related. I, I think what you outlined is what one of the biggest ironies of, of, of various migrations, right? When we we get black people moving uh, to let's take my city for example, moving to Chicago from from places in Louisiana and Memphis and all that, coming to coming to Chicago, and they come to a location which is heavily segregated, both legally and, and illegally. You know, everything start restrictive covenants, which limit black movement and black opportunity to move into, into white neighborhoods. You have bombings, you have, you have intimidations, you have violence, mm -hmm. keeping largely hemming black people in these really small communities. But within these communities, what's, what's allowed to happen, instead of being mere victims of oppression and, and segregation and racism, we find these dynamic communities being, being developed. And you have black doctors, black lawyers, black banks, so forth and so on. Because people are largely forced to live in one particular neighborhood. Right. Now this goes on uh, you know, we think about the legal provisions that allowed this to happen starting about the mid to late 1920s, when you know legislation and laws and policies started being put into real estate contracts that, that okay. hand black people in restrictive covenants and the mm -hmm. like. By the mid 1930s, we had the federal government getting involved with this, saying that you know black people shouldn't be allowed to enter into any neighborhood with a threat to property values. Mm -hmm. 1940, yes. we see started seeing some successful court challenges. By 1947, we see this process is deemed illegal by the, uh, by the Supreme Court in a Supreme Court case called Shelley v. Kramer, right? So what happens after this, those black people with the resources, us folks with the resources are moving out of these restrictive and these, uh, these confined communities. And they're moving out, and they're moving into homes in surrounding white neighborhoods. So what does this do? This pushes, as you mentioned, pushes white people out of their neighborhoods into the suburbs. Right. right, those people with the resources are able to buy better houses. True. Mm -hmm. Over time, we find as white people are moving to the suburbs, this particular group of black people, this is called the black middle class, the aspirational class, are begin to move into the suburbs. Right. Ironically, by these same homes that were abandoned by white people who were renting in the first place. Right. <laughs> yes. So, so, so what happens is that as these white people are living in these in these communities in the suburbs. They're trying to look back into the cities and say it's a better housing stock. There's better opportunities for uh, for entertainment. They're you know you're much closer to work, and they're moving back into the cities that the homes that were recently abandoned by middle class and aspirational class black people. So this is like yeah. the, the the whole irony of this entire.
entire thing, right? We're our our early generations are abandoning prime real estate to go out to the suburbs. Yes, right. That's, and that's now white people are coming back into cities, and they're largely pricing us out. Yes, yes. And would you like to comment on that, Doctor Beach? Well, I think he's uh, he's correct. I mean, a lot of uh, the movement they. Uh, we move in, they move out, and now they're moving back in. So uh, and say, "Don't you come back?" <laughs> yeah. But most of the, uh, a lot of the movement, uh, at least initially, uh, from the south to the north, was based on economic pressures. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get more jobs, better jobs in the north, and that's, that's right. why uh, folks moved in the '40s uh, to the north. And so I think that that movement, uh, at least on a retirement basis, now you're finding more blacks moving back south. That's true. Uh, That's to, true. Uh, because the quality of life is a little better, and uh, some things are cheaper. Not everything, but some That's things right. are cheaper, and that helps on the retirement budget. But uh, migration generally uh, revolves around people seeking a better life. Yes. You know, I agree. That's what they want. I agree. Now, do, um, Dr. Kimball, I'll ask you first. Do you feel that gentr gentrification overall is a bad thing or a good thing overall for African-American communities? Or African American well, people. It, well, that 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 depends, right? It's hard to pin a historian down to a good or bad. But that that <laughs> depends. <laughs> is that historian? Is that, are you guys like related to politicians? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Go yeah, ahead. Well, go ahead. I'm from, I'm from Chicago. Everything is political. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But but it, it largely depends, right? Because you know, gentrification. I think is a very slippery slope too. Because I think I think. Ordinarily, it, it means white displacement of, of, of black and brown neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But you know, in, in early the early days of, of, of in some of these communities, we find that you know these these white people we saw in the eighties, the puppies, mm -hmm. yes. these are moving yes. back. Puppies are moving back and they're displacing poor and working class black people out of their communities. Right, which is it just causes a whole lot of tension, right? Because yes. it's easy to to target your animosity to people who don't look like you come into your community. That's right. Right. But it's 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 complicated when you when you look at these affluent black people coming to your neighborhood and changing the dynamics. So it depends like like who who we're talking about. For people like me, right, gentrification is you know, you get a, a high quality in, in housing. Right, mm -hmm. you're getting the clubs, you're getting the stores, you're getting the Starbucks, right? But for <laughs> yeah. the people who existed in the community after my people left, right, they're getting the short end of the stick, right? Because the taxes are going up, and the 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 not a police uh, uh, presence is going up. So again, it, it depends. It depends on, on on who you are and what kind of resources you have. Okay. But I but I will say this. I think I think something we didn't talk about yesterday. As, as I thought back in our conversation. I think something I, I wanted to talk about was that I think gentrification overall for black people mm -hmm. and, this, and as we move out of the city, it's going to be bad for us politically, right? Because the, the center of the black political base are in the cities. And as we move into the suburbs, right, we're going to lose a lot of our political, our political strengths, you know, as, mm -hmm. as far as our voting power, our access to political, political, uh, 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 the political process, right? Mm -hmm. And we're moving further away from the center of black politics in our cities that we move into the suburbs and out of our states. You know, Illinois is one of these states that are losing black population. Mm, mm -hmm. Which is the irony, like the, the, the state that gives us Barack Obama is losing black political power. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely I definitely see that. Uh, and you're right, too, in terms of um, when you dissipate, um, you know, you know, because that's I guess the same argument with segregation versus integration. Was mm -hmm. it good or was it bad? And it all mm -hmm. depends on you know what resulted for you per se. Because I think you know some things were lost, some things were gained mm -hmm. uh, in that. And so you know now you have you know the Trump era or the Trump um, administration, which is causing people to now reevaluate what did we what what where where, where are our gains and, and and where are we really. Uh, and so looking at back at an earlier paradigm when we were maybe, you know, more confined, but we had a little bit more unity and solidarity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did want you to address that question as well in terms of, you know, what your thoughts are about gentrification uh, overall. Well, I I what, I'm sorry, I lost, lost your 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to uh, Dr. Beach because you can't see me, but I, I had pointed <laughs> to him. I'm sorry. Uh, but I had pointed to him for him to also, before we let you go, uh, to address uh, what his thoughts were about the pros and cons for gentrification. Yeah, well, I think that uh, gentrification at this point in time is has a lot to do with economics mm -hmm. in terms of people uh, moving into a neighborhood for their own convenience and uh, maybe proximity to, to jobs. And as you said, the restaurants, the clubs, and other amenities that uh, upper class or middle class people like. And those black middle class folks like the same things. You know? That's right. Okay, yes. so gentrification uh, can be good for the, the black middle class if they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. what, what also happens in neighborhoods, uh, generally, after over a period of time, people develop their own culture. They get used to certain things. Yes. It's what's called a sense of place. Yes. This is this is my home, This is and this is the way we do things. That's right. So That's in the right. gentrification, a lot of that changes. Yes. You know, now, you know, instead of basketball courts, you got dog parks. Yes. You know? <laughs> and, um, That's true. That's true. And that That's may true. or may not be uh, something that we're used to or interested in. Correct. And so we feel uncomfortable with that change. Uh, but... Um, in the long run, gentrification is going to be good for the community and the society. You know, you just have to adjust and, and you can stay. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some statistics say people are not pushing you out, but if you can't afford to, to live at that rate, then you leave. Right. You know, so it mm -hmm. uh, depends on how you look at it. Okay. Okay, very good. Well, Dr. Kimball, I appreciate uh, you calling in to talk to us about this subject. And I think, you know, before uh, the end of our season, we probably will revisit this topic again because I think it's it's a relevant uh, theme and maybe explore it uh, even a little more uh, a little more deeply. I know for myself as a real estate agent, uh, I have one family that has been earnestly looking for housing mm -hmm. in the area and they're considering moving down south because of the type of housing, the pricing of housing, mm. which be would be much more affordable. Right. Now, of course, that can be relative because if your employment rate uh, does not stay the same mm. and you have to settle for a lesser job, then finding a decent housing at a price you can't afford in the South could still be problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have another client that is looking to move South for a better quality of living, a more affordable quality of living. They're closer to the retirement ages, right. you know, where they have that job stability. They won't really have a loss of income mm. because of the type of job that they have. So that makes moving, you know, all the all the sweeter for them because I can have all the amenities at a lower, you know, annual cost of living mm -hmm. than what I have here and maybe be able to access, access more things than I could in my current environment. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, we'll be posting your information on our page. So if, if our audience would like to uh, take a look at your articles, look at your books, uh, they'll be able to do that. And uh, we also appreciate the work that you've been doing with Asala and uh, just helping keep uh, our history alive. It was my pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Goodbye. You. So, one of the other topics that came up, which is why your trip was so relevant, and I was so excited to hear from Reba that mm -hmm. you just got back from Africa because mm -hmm. um, Kojo Namdi was one of the panelists there. So, speak, speaking about migration, not only from within the country, mm -hmm. but from outside the country right. and in, inside the country, um, uh, Jelani Cobb told a really cute story uh, about a dark-skinned Indian mm -hmm. from India right. that had come uh, to the United States via Haiti. Okay. And he ended up, I, I want to say in Texas, and I did post this on my page, so if you want to take a look at it, it is there. Um, but uh, when he got there, you know, the white people were there was like, well, we don't know anything about New Delhi, but you's a, you's a nigra, <laughs> pretty right. much, you know. Yeah. And so he said, well... Okay, well, maybe I am. Uh, and so he, <coughs> excuse me, he married an African-American woman. And the African-Americans there said, yeah, you're one of us, you know. Right. And uh, I think he proceeded to a uh, position of prominence with one of the black uh, uh, organizations mm -hmm. within the town. They elected him, and, you know, he was the head of the organization. Right. 
but he wasn't what you would call a um a, a natural African American, so right. to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, Mr. Cobb was was just pointing out, and he went on to talk about how we sometimes define our blackness like. Well, you know, you from that plantation over there, but you know their chains was lighter than the chains that was over here because our chains yeah. was heavier. Yeah. See, y'all just had one set of leg irons, and we have more than you know. And it's you know, we talk about our blackness as through the lens of how much we feel like we suffered. We right. suffered more than the black people. Right. You know, we suffered more than the people that the, the house Negroes, and mm. and you know, because we were the field Negroes. Right. Well, you know, Mr. So and So's plantation, they treat y'all better, and those kinds of things. And sometimes that's we we focus on what makes us different right. more than what makes us alike. Mm. So you have uh, headed up. I've participated. I've promoted. I'll be there this year. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And if you don't know, Dr. Beach uh, heads up ProBiz, which is intent on making sure that small businesses are not only aware of opportunities, but they actually have uh, an opportunity during his event to interact with people that make decisions that, you know, you are the ones that you're going to end up sitting down and talking to about getting funding and things like that for your uh, for your project or for what you're trying to do with your business. So he provides a form for you to have that interaction. Mm -hmm. But he also does the same thing if you're looking to do business in Africa. And tell us why you do that. <laughs> well, I, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for that. Uh, ProBiz this year is July 25th. All right. <laughs> at you the, heard it. Uh, Crown gonna... Plaza Hotel in, uh, right. in uh, Greenbelt. Uh, but uh, we, you know, you talk about Africa, uh, this is really a big picture kind of thing. Those are our cousins, our brothers, right. our sisters there. That's right. They have many, many resources, much more than we have. I mean, you'd just be totally surprised. It's a billion point one people on the continent, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's growing. Their their gross domestic product, the GDP, is, you know, 6%. You know, I was wow. here in the United States, it's like maybe three, right, two and right. a half to three. So, and they got a population that's growing exponentially as well. The future for a lot of people in business really is in Africa. The market is going to be there. Mm -hmm. They've got a young population. Mm -hmm. You know, average age is under 30, you know. Oh, wow. I okay. mean, they got a real, real young population. Now, what we here in America need to do is to connect with them. We mm -hmm. have a lot more experience, expertise um, in business areas mm -hmm. than they do. They could use that kind of uh, help in developing their own economies in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do, tie the African diaspora together with the Africans in Africa and see if we can't both benefit, have a mutual beneficial relationship, and everybody make some money. That, that adds another dimension to buy black, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, that's economics. I mean, you have to begin to trade within your own circle, your own community, if that's you right. expect the community to grow. You know, we talk about businesses in the black community. Well, they depend on the, the, the customers to come in and buy something from them. That's right. If, they, if they're going to survive. That's and right. these same businesses, what? They hire other black people. The work That's for right. the employment base is there. That's These right. black people do what? Then they live in uh, apartments and they also buy from other stores, other black stores. So we got to figure out a way to continue that circulation of our dollars to build mm -hmm. our own community's economy. I agree. I agree. And, you know, um, I think that many times, because I think I shared with you before, it was only when I got to college uh, that I really had a sense of black history mm. and black continuity yeah. that really tied me to Africa. Right. You know, Africa was those people over there, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the Tarzan movie, yeah, right? right. I'm, I'm, I'm being totally honest. That's true. And we were the, we were the, we were the black people over here. We was oppressed, but we were, it was like, it was the same thing, you know, we weren't from that plantation. We yeah. were from the plantation over yeah. here. And so there wasn't really a connection or a desire mm -hmm. to be connected. Uh, and I think, um, Many of us may have been shaped more so by misperceptions. You don't often hear of uh, African achievements mm -hmm. when you look at our media. Right. What you hear is 
you know, oh, this this tribe killed these people. These right. these people, um, these rebels uh, stole these mm -hmm. people, and right. you know, and that's that's really all you ever hear. You know, we celebrated Mandela. Okay, it's over now. So we're back to business as usual. And I think that you know, when the movie Black Panther came out. Now, I knew about the comic from you. I'm, I'm a big comic fan, trust me. <laughs> I love comics. And so I knew about the character, you know, long before he was mainstream and it's right. a big deal. Yeah, and and it, Yes. Yeah. Um, but to see people um, rallying around, that's nice. But that's always... We always have been people of ingenuity. We've, mm. If you... You know, when you look at black history, which I always say it's... Um, February is Black History Month. Actually, February is African is, is American History Month with a black focus. Mm -hmm. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. You know, but we have contributed so many things to the fabric of America that if we were told to leave, to take all of what we brought with us, mm -hmm. there would be just a husk. Right. I mean, honestly, we have we have we're we're integral Absolutely. to how the how the to country everything runs. Everything this country is yes. today. But mm -hmm. because we don't know that mm -hmm. We don't operate like we know this. So, you know, we were cheering on, you know, all the technological advances and the vibranium and all this stuff. But we have that. We have that capacity. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I appreciate uh, what you're doing. One person uh, in the uh, in the panel uh, from uh, Saturday's event, if you missed it, you need to go to the solid.org website and catch up because it was a really lively discussion. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about, well, what if we as a people... I guess kind of like Marcus Garvey decided, hey, we're just going to migrate out of the country mm -hmm. uh, and go out. And I, I don't know for me personally if that's the answer, although I wouldn't mind having a home on, on two continents. I'm good mm. with that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Uh, but I believe that um, together, that kind of unity to be able to have your business here in the United States, but also have viable, profitable trade with the continent of Africa can then help you more greatly establish your position here. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Nika, you know, you can take what you're doing here, buy land here, buy land here, and really begin to um, have a, a great legacy there. Now you um what did you what did you learn specifically in the trip that you went with? What what really stood out to you? You got you gonna like this, okay? okay. What was I doing in Africa? What were you doing in, in Africa with, without me, right? Without me. Like, I just found out he got back. I am involved in Kenya's new uh, affordable housing program. They Go got, ahead, they, now. They got, the, president, oh, awesome. the president of Kenya uh, has decided that, at least he told the general population, he's mm. going to build 500,000 affordable houses over the next four years. Mm. We need to and, give him an opening over here. I got some places he can build some houses. I got a list, y'all. Oh, and, um, and it's really a fascinating idea because it's going to change the dynamics of Kenya. They're going to upgrade the housing uh, uh, for for major for the population. Really, they've got they've got 50 million people in Kenya. Okay, but wow. this is an effort to get folks out of the, the shanty towns, get them out of the slums, and mm -hmm. get some decent housing, affordable mm -hmm. housing at a, at a reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, there uh, there's a program that they've they've started. Like I say, the government is going to help guarantee some of the financing. The government is going to give some land to the developers to help mm -hmm. them out. Mm -hmm. And they're going to provide a lot of the infrastructure uh, for the uh, house. We're actually going to build some new cities, Can you know. I, okay, and, uh, that's awesome. be new roads and new, new everything. And uh, so I'm really excited about, you know, participating in that. And we're working on a couple of projects. I haven't, none of them been signed yet. Right. We're working on a couple of projects where we'll have some American architects and engineers go over there to help do some of the design work mm. and do some project management on the construction. Okay. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that kind of involvement, and we're talking about uh, talking about a lot of money. You know, some projects, you know, two hundred eighty million dollar projects, that uh, you know we, we're going to be able to bring some of that money back home. You know, that's here. right. So it's a, and a good thinking deal. about you know we, we're dealing with low inventory here mm -hmm. uh, in in some of the markets, and um, you know whether it's, it's the climate for fixing and flipping or rehabbing and those kinds of things. But here's a whole nother panorama 
of right. opportunity Absolutely. that's out there. And when you look at, because um, I know I have a lot of realtors that watch this show. Uh, this I'm directing this to Kim Lee Naylor, who's doing great things in the Detroit area uh, with the National Association of Black Women in Construction. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for you guys, you know, to have Mr. Beach in, you know, as, you know, they progress, you know, where, wherever he deems it's appropriate to come and talk to your organization about, you know, what's going on, you know, and how you can expand uh, your base. And I know, you know, we all have trust issues, right? Mm -hmm, right? We have trust issues and how things are gonna go and, you know, are they gonna, is it gonna? But, you know, we have to start somewhere. You know, I was listening to you saying, you know, don't have everything signed yet, but we're already talking about it. And the scripture that says, despise not the day of small beginnings, mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to start somewhere. And oftentimes when we're looking for opportunities, we limit the avenues where we, we think they're acceptable to come from. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to stop doing that. And I always like that about you that um, whenever you, we talk, I always learn something new. And you're always looking at how we can expand the opportunities Absolutely. for others and, and be inclusive in what we have. I can tell you when I was at ProBiz, um, last year, just the number of embassies that were there that came in with statistics, like we have this kind of resource, we have that kind of resource, mm. we, we're building this right here. Are there problems? Sure there are, but we have problems here too, yeah, you know? So there are problems, but you know, the problems that you have here don't prevent you from still trying to seek better opportunities. It is a global uh, economy. My friend Stephen Underwood is, he's a global thinker. He's been mm. on my show a couple of times, good friend of mine, but he's always thinking globally. Yeah. And so, with it, I mean, this makes everything, you know, just easy. You can, I can go on here, I can check out BBC, I can get video, mm -hmm. I can get video from the man on the street in Kenya, I can see a, a broadcast from the Kenyan, you know, uh, um, administration. I can see whatever I need to see, just this this piece right here. So it's a small world. Um, if someone is interested in getting involved uh, with trade or just starting on their information gathering to see mm -hmm. if it's a fit for them, how, how can they get started? Well, one of the things that we've done uh, working with the African Union, mm -hmm. uh, which is the organization representing all the countries in Africa, we started a group called the African Diaspora Business Roundtable. Okay. And it's going to serve as an information resource for people okay. that are interested in doing business uh, in Africa okay. and uh, allow the African diaspora to begin to have a larger role in what I call private sector development. A lot of times, you know, all we hear about is the government. Right. But in business, it's the private sector that really moves the that's economy. Right. You that's know? right. And there mm -hmm. is a, a diaspora private sector that's ready to do some business. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get the uh, U.S. government and all its resources, USAID, mm -hmm. the State Department, the uh, Commerce Department, to be able to give us the same resources. They're providing other American business when it comes to doing business in Africa. Right. And that takes a little effort. But That's the, right. you'd be surprised. There's money available. There's all kinds of mm. technical assistance available if you want to do business overseas. And we, like I say, Africa is where uh, we're interested in trying to do business. Uh, and it's... Um, we just have to focus and do it. And as you say, things happen, but you got things happen anywhere. Happen but I anywhere. personally believe there are more opportunities for us in Africa than there are in some parts of the United States. Right I now, agree. when you go to bid on something, you got 25 people bidding on it. That's but over right. there, you may have three. You That's know, right. Because you've got more expertise and experience that you can offer uh, to the solicitor that uh, you, know, you might be surprised that you can get the job. That's it. And the thing is, now you leverage that experience that you're gaining there back in the marketplace here. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that um, for those of you that are listening today, um, you know, you say, well, yeah, you know, but that's a long way. But, you know, I think you owe it to yourself to, um, to stay tuned in. To stay plugged in. What's the word now? Stay woke. I don't know. <laughs> Half the time I feel like I'm asleep, but, you know, I, don't, I just I don't know. But, um, but to be aware of opportunities. How many people, when gentrification was first starting in mm. D.C., was trying to figure out how to leave and let's just get rid of the house. And we don't want Grandmama house because... You know, we got to fix it up. We, let's yeah. just sell it because she's, you know, she's going. Maybe she's going to long term care. She's going to something like that. And we don't want to. We don't want it. And now you drive by Grandmama's house, and <laughs> you like, and, and you tell the kids, that's that's what Grandmama used to be like. 
really? Yeah. Right? Oh, all of that? Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, and you wish now that you have held on to right. it. How many times have you heard about an opportunity as an entrepreneur? Uh, maybe you do interior design. Maybe you do different things that, you know, you hear about something, but you hear about it after. Mm -hmm. And you wish you could have been at the forefront. So what Dr. Beach is sharing with you are things that are in the inception stage, but it's not so far advanced that you can't participate if you want to. So I just want to encourage you, uh, July 25th, um, you better get ready, get your tickets for Pro Biz and Africa Biz, I'm gonna have my tickets. So I'm just saying you're gonna be there because we're gonna have him back on for that so he can talk to you uh, about that. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to share with them before I do some of the housekeeping and? and well, just things? you know, just interesting what you said about your uh, your, uh, your cell phone mm -hmm. in Africa and in particular, let's take Kenya. You know, they do more things with their cell phone than we do. Get out. They've got something called M-Pesa. They do their banking mm -hmm. on the phone. They can mm -hmm. send money to each other on the phone mm -hmm. without going through a bank. I mean, they do it through just, their just phone. Just straight through the phone. Their phone also, they can borrow money on the phone, they can save money, their savings account on the Get phone. Out. Their credit is based on how they handle their phone bill, okay? Get out they of are here. more advanced in mobile, using mobile technology than we are. We're mm -hmm. trying to catch up here in America and what mm -hmm. they're doing. And they had to do it because there were no lines, landlines right. going to where right. But now with the cell phone, they're connected to the families in the villages, mm -hmm. so the, the city and the villages are connected, and they're doing great things with and, their phone. And that's, I think, you know, you, you just you were just strengthening the other point, which is we can't just accept what we see in the media. You know, the term fake news has just gotten <laughs> so much play, uh -huh. and and it's 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 been used so inaccurately, <laughs> shall we say? That's a nice way to say it, right? Um, but we have to understand that. The people that control the media control the message. Mm -hmm. And you have to look for ways to get information that's credible, okay, independently. Mm -hmm. And not just take uh, what you've heard. It's just like when I get people to try to get people to come out to my events, you know, mm -hmm. to learn about the grants. So I have lenders on here. People say, well, you know, I don't know. Well, I don't know if I'm ready for the market yet. Well, I haven't seen the price of houses really going down <laughs> a lot. I'm just saying. I mean, <clears throat> sure, I've seen some price adjustments, some yeah. corrections in the market, but there hasn't been like this wholesale price drop where they're yeah. saying today and today only for President's Day, 30% yeah. off every house on the market. Yeah. It's not happening. Not happening um, right. I know people have been seeing the interest rates go up because I think when I first started in uh, real estate, uh, interest rates were much higher, mm -hmm. and then I saw them go down really right. low. You know, you're in the threes, and you yeah. know, and then now they're starting to creep back up. Yeah. They dipped down for just a minute, and the, uh, one of the reports I read was so many more people rushed out into the marketplace. Right. You know, so but I don't think we're gonna see this going down that much, that much, uh, that many more times. So therefore, you've got to take advantage and be well, prepared, slow now, it is and, and, low and now. yeah, and get and get you know get in there or at least find out what you need to know mm -hmm. to get in there. Like we're having a home buyers boot camp. I know I've been announcing it. Some of you all, last minute people, I've been calling people too because people have told me, I want to come. So we met in the afternoon for you from three to five. Uh, we're going to be with uh, Reginald Dirksen Sr. He's a, a, a mortgage a banker for Old Line Bank mm -hmm. going uh, 4201 Mitchellville Road uh, in Bowie. We're going to be in Suite 200. Uh, Iberia Coe, she's known as the Wealth Building C uh, CPA. Uh, she's going to be there. Uh, she's going to have a table. Mm -hmm. She's going to be talking to you during the break in terms of if you need some help with your taxes, if you're an investor, or just to, you know your average homeowner, prospective homeowner, have some questions about how the taxes are working. Um, she is great with that. Um, so she's going to be there. But um, one thing I like about Old Line is they layer grants for you. Okay. You know, so sometimes you think, well, I looked at this grant and, you know, it's, it's just not working for me. I've watched him with my own clients take grant A and then put it over here with a little something from grant B. And then we got the, this loan program where if you don't move, you know, you don't have to worry about even paying this back possibly ever. <laughs> or 
until you get ready to move out. Yeah. Okay? So when you can look at an organization that's looking to see how much money they can give you. I have a client that had, and I mentioned this, I think, on the, uh, one of my other shows, um, $10,000 mm-hmm. down payment. Right. Because it was a condo that wasn't FHA approved. Mm-hmm. But they have a streamlined process that they can get that through a lot of times for you. Mm-hmm. And they'll run, through, run it through, and if it goes through there, then it's approved. Uh, but because of the type of condo, she needed that higher down payment, $10,000 uh, down. And then because of the type of property, she needed about um, 8000 in closing cost mm. help. So between the program, she's, she's, gone through, she's gone through two online classes <laughs> and one sit-down eight-hour class uh. to get her all her certificates. But I'm telling you, she's not complaining because right now she's getting close to 15000 Yes, fifteen thousand of that eighteen thousand or wow. so that she needs in grant and loan programs. So just think about how little she has to come to the table mm-hmm. with. And hers is a, a different type of property, but there are other. If you're a teacher, and now it's not even that you have to be a teacher. If you're in the in the school, so you're a bus driver. Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying to you that there are options and opportunities for you, and even if it's not today. When you have a goal, when you have an objective, and right. you say, hey, this program's out here. Right. And uh, so I got to knuckle down. I got to take care of this because I can I can get this right here. And you have an objective. We well, you don't know. you kind of like, well, I know I need to be doing better, but I mean, even if I did better, I don't think I could. Yeah. So you don't have an objective. So that's, that's what these information sessions are for. I'm not trying to we're not trying to rush you anything, but we mm. want you to know because just like just like Dr. B said, there's money available for those projects. There's technical assistance available, but you don't know if you don't go find out. All right. So we want you to come out. I want you to go to Eventbrite. The link's on our Facebook page. Go to Eventbrite. Sign up because we're going to have light refreshments. You don't want to be the only person there with light and no refreshment, okay? <laughs> and that's what's going to happen if I don't know that you're coming. doesn't mean you can't still come. I might have a bag of chips for you in my bag, but I want you to sign up and I want you to uh, participate. Now, I have a couple of announcements to make, so, you know, i gotta got to take my non-bifocals off so I can go on here and pull a couple of them up. Uh, last week uh, in the studio, we had Charles Blair. He's known as the mad scientist in uh, uh, fondly as the mm. mad, mad scientist because mm. he's such a marketing genius in the area of real estate investing. He's helped other investors, and, of course, he's built his business. Uh, and he shared with us that... He had a ninth grade education, mm. and but because of his ninth grade education, he f- he found out about real estate investing and started out wholesaling and found out you can make money doing that. And he said, you know, I can I can do this, and it was such an excitement for him, and it really changed his life. Mm-hmm. And he's taught. I mean, he's come so much farther from where he started, and he's taught so many people about real estate investing. Uh, those of you that were here for the break that saw the commercial about my RE360, uh, 360, the real estate investment tool platform, um, this young man, he was an engineer. Mm-hmm. He then uh, decided to get into investing because he realized, even though I've got a degree and I've got a, a degree in a good field, mm-hmm. it's not always stable. Yeah. So let me find something else. So he was doing something else, and he started investing in real estate, and he just organically grew his business. You know, real estate investing can be really uh, challenging um, uh, for you, but it also the rewards are good for you mm-hmm. in, in, in terms of growing your business. So one of the things that uh, Tammy Phelps with Capital City REA, she's having a webinar this evening. I'm going to post her flyer uh, on there. Now she just sent me an email. She was going to try to join us, but she has a meeting. Um, but uh, you can still go on and register for the live webinar. It starts at 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, and they're going to be discussing the Investing in Opportunity Act. And it gives uh, investors um, and communities and taxpayers an opportunity to focus on the underserved communities right. and invest in those communities. So uh, if you have money in your retirement or things that, you know, or money that you just maybe you have it sitting in a CD, mm-hmm. it's not really bringing you a lot of return on investment, and you're socially minded and money minded, mm-hmm. and you're thinking, I need an, I need an opportunity. It would help you to look at what they're talking about because they're going to talk about the pros and the cons, things to watch out, but also the advantages. So I'm going to post that for you so you can take a look at that. Um, I also have 
uh, an announcement uh, from a dear friend of ours, uh, Jeanette Brandon. And Jeanette um, did a great event uh, a few years ago. I think it was last year on domestic violence. And she was sharing... Um, uh, an announcement with us for today. She says, if you or anyone you know have been faced with the task of taking care of your loved ones, placing them in a nursing home, uh, assisted living, um, they're going to be doing a workshop that deals with some of the challenges. And it's going to be conducted by the Department of Aging, uh, the director. This is going to be March the 23rd, 2019, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., 1250 Benning Road in Capitol Heights. And I'll also post that uh, on our site as well. Um, so like I said, you know, tackling topics like this, this is, I'm, I'm really excited because you're going to be on a couple more times this year. <laughs> well, I, I'm really, we, we're going to talk, we didn't tell you, but we're going to talk about a regular segment because that was my vision during the time that we were on a break, talking about economic development, mm -hmm. talking about trade development, because whenever there's economic development, economic development and real estate, they go hand in hand. Absolutely. And yeah. so, um, you know, helping us get our minds right. That's what's most important. It is. <laughs> Lord knows. I thank all of you all that have been praying for my mind. <laughs> I, I, I feel my help coming, okay? It's coming. <laughs> um, but having our mind right when we're looking at opportunities uh, is so important. And so I do appreciate the work that you do uh, and, uh, you know, looking to have uh, perhaps some of the embassies come in, mm -hmm. uh, some of the different groups, the African Union perhaps, have yeah. a, a representative come in and we do a conversation where people can get to know Who's, who's saying what and what's mm. being said because a lot of times when we don't see it, you right. know, we, we're not farmers. We, we don't know a thing or two because we haven't seen a thing or two. <laughs> so we need to see a thing or two so we can know a Absolutely. thing or two. That's right. So I want to thank you all for tuning in to us today. Dr. Beach, thank you for being just a thank great, you for me. Really great guest it. co host for us. And remember, everyone, I'll see you at the show. <laughs>